So good evening. For those who don't know who I am, I'm Jaime Correa, and I'm the current director of the undergraduate program here at the School of Architecture. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the first thematic salon at the School of Architecture. The idea of the salons was developed by Associate Dean Sonia Chow and by Dean Ro Rudolf El Huri in order to promote our faculty and our program initiatives and also to provide a venue to discuss and to debate issues of contemporary theory and practice. But most importantly, to generate public interest on what we do here. This semester, the Salon series will focus on our labs and our centers. And the first one to be featured is the so-called CHILD, Community Housing, Community Housing, Community Housing and Identity Lab, CHILD, and CHILDING it is. Uh, the CHILL lab is led by Professor Germain, Germain Barnes, uh, who has made a national and an international reputation for himself. Germain was a recent fellow at the American Academy in Rome, and he is also the winner of the Architectural League Prize among many, many, many recent awards. His works uh, investigate the intersection between identity and architecture, and he has developed a great interest on the idea of black domesticity and public awareness. Topics which he, he and his team have been able to consolidate by means of installations and exhibitions all over the, basically the world now. Yeah. The work of the CHILL lab explores these topics as well as ideas of social and political resiliency. Just to quote a little bit from the website description, Chill understands that the built environment is manipulated by factors that extend beyond conventional construction procedures and attempts to highlight the narratives of marginalized communities. Germain and his team, uh, who he considers his colleagues more than just his assistants, will tell us today how it is possible to go from Miami to the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, and will probably give us a preview of the theoretical and practical work required in today's profession to be able to be selected as an independent representative at the Biennale de Arquitectura in Venice 2023, where he has, given, um, he has been given a prominent site on the grounds of the Arsenale. Without more background, let me introduce you to Professor Germain, uh, Germain Barnes and to the CHILL team. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, wow, that's bright. All right. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, for being here on a Thursday afternoon. I know that you are here for the food and the alcohol and not for me, but uh, I accept you being here nonetheless. So for today's chat, um, I'll introduce the team so you all can see who helps to produce the work that we do in the lab. And then we'll go through some slides so you guys can see the work that we've been doing and that we're currently working on. Um, and then I'm gonna ask them some questions about what it means to work in the lab. Uh, so just a bit of background around the name of Chill and how it came to be. Uh, I'm from Chicago. So I really just wanted to find a way to use the word shy as a name. So it's actually shy lab. I just say chill because then I can call myself the director of chill. But in pure honesty, it's just really just we just want to put it out Chicago and that's it. So to my left is one of the former chill members who is now an architectural designer at HKS, Clarissa Hellebrand. Everybody say hello and clap, please. Followed by Kayvon Washington, who's currently a fourth year student? Fifth year, he old. Fifth year student, and he graduates soon. Give a round of applause for Kayvon. 
our newest and youngest team member, George William Elliott. And our youngest graduate student, Noel Davis. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't say why aren't the names matching what's on the screen of the panelists. Uh, my second in command, Andrea Martinez, could not make it with us tonight. Uh, she fell a bit ill. Um, so we had to bring in some reinforcements because she is a hero and it doesn't take one person to fill her shoes. It takes multiple people to fill her shoes. So uh, if you guys know Andrea, send her a get well soon text or something. Um, or you see her on campus, same thing. So that said, we're going to go ahead and jump into this thing. Okay, so what does it mean to chill? They made me come up with a title. Uh, the first project we're gonna talk about is Uneasy Lies the Head That Wears a Crown. It was an installation and exhibition design that we did in Broward County uh, for the Department of Cultural Affairs. Um, we designed a series of chairs and we essentially unfolded a shotgun home um, within the entire gallery. And so a lot of the research that we do, again, around marginalized communities, uh, as someone that identifies as black, the shotgun home is one of those identifiable uh, vernaculars that we can claim as our own. So we essentially took this form and then redistributed it within the space. And then we erected walls and we made curtains um, and then we built these chairs as well. And then because we have a big emphasis on community, all of the photographs that were in the installation were actually from community members that live in the historic district known as Sistrunk. So that way all the people that are from the community can also take part in the uh, exhibition as well and be able to have a sense of pride for where they lived because if they don't understand or don't see themselves in the work, then in my opinion, we're not doing it right. So I will pause right there and then now uh, allow Clarissa to tell you all about the chairs that we actually, one of which we have here on display. So thank you. Um, I'm really happy to be here tonight uh, as a formal UM student. And I think that one of these, well, working with Germain and especially in this project was super special to me because it takes architecture to not only a real level, but a community-based level where you understand the community and you want to celebrate the things that normal in, in their normal lives it wouldn't be a big thing or it wouldn't be celebrated. So we started to research a lot about the Sistrunk uh, neighborhood and their history. And it mainly came up to these traditions and their, their uh, normal day-to-day -day activities that really stood out to us. And within the ritual images that we found the Yucca new um, celebrate, celebrations that we got into this design of the chair and we started thinking of the chair as a, a dining room chair in in the conceptual phase and once we got into the real design phase we just wanted to celebrate everything in the chair itself so kind of take it to a literal aspect of it so the chair itself is uh, yellow metal frame chair weaved on the on the back end, but the different in between the chairs is the is the wooden back where you sit on it, and I think each one of it represents the culture in a different way. Some of them are literal, and some of them more design based. <laughs> so, I. A real good part that we enjoyed about this was that we, I'm from Venezuela, so I got uh, uh, my mom's friend who was recently here as an immigrant and didn't have a job to weave the chairs. So for us, it was very, a kind of emotional job to start something that, with communities that aren't celebrated, celebrated to join them in people that are having a hard time too and they're trying to make their lives better. You. 
So, well, we started with eight chairs, I think. We started with six. Six. Yeah. Six. We started with six. Uh, as a project manager, chairs are very harder to make than what we think. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it escalated quickly, right? <laughs> yeah, it went from six chairs. So in, in full transparency, uh, we designed like 15 chairs. We only made six because the budget of Broward County Cultural Affairs wasn't very large. Like they were being very cheap. So we only were able to make six of them. Um, but I think one of the important things that Clarissa mentioned is the fact that we really wanted to celebrate multiple cultures. And I think having the, the weaver, every single chair has a different type of design. So I implore you all, if you get a chance, to take a much closer look at the fabric, at the design of the chairs themselves, because it also was to reference hair. And that's where the title of the crown came from, because unfortunately, in, in the world that we live in, if you're someone who identifies as black and your hair may not be straight, it might be in dreadlocks, it might be um, different than how we typically see it, people tend to police your hair. And for us, hair is extremely important. Like your hair is your crown. Um, so like you see to my left and you see Kayvon vehemently shaking his head, right? Like there shouldn't be a reason to why he's not accepted purely because he has dreadlocks. So a lot of the work that we do, again, because it's rooted in identity, is also to celebrate the mundane to us but to other people, they might see it as interesting. And none of this would have happened without Clarissa leading this project. That is an absolute like, guarantee. None of this stuff happens without her help. I was going to put in the picture that she's in, but I know she gets very shy, so I didn't want to put that picture up there on the board. Just getting her to do this was already difficult enough. Um, but thank you, Clarissa, uh, for all of your help and for coming back to this panel, even though you have a real job now. So as uh, our fearless leader, uh, Professor Jaime Correa mentioned, you all would get to see some of the work that we did at MoMA, uh, which was graciously supported by the School of Architecture here and was done with a lot of the students within the Chill Lab, which was titled A Spectrum of Blackness, which really highlights the multiplicities of the diaspora here in Miami, which is so awesome. You can look like me and be Colombian, Bahamian, Cuban, Jamaican, all these various ethnicities which you don't find in many other cities. And I think that's one of the most amazing things about this uh, hemispheric location that we call home. And so it started with giving us a various set of sites. And notice you don't see Miami on this list. Uh, students, I was always taught it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. So I kind of just told the curatorial team, I'm going to do Miami, even though it's not on the list, to which they said, OK, fine. Like, that's totally OK to go ahead and do that. So we wanted to again talk about ritual and space, specifically the porch, the kitchen, and water, because you can't talk about Miami without talking about water. And we have an entire resiliency academy that's coming on. I don't know how many of you all know this, but when talking about water in South Florida, it's important to understand that if you were a black person, it wasn't until the 1970s and 80s that you were allowed to go to Miami Beach without a racial identification card. So on the, on the screen right now, if you were someone who were black, you had to have one of these, just like you have to have a driver's license in order to access Miami Beach. And so this is like the history of the place of where we live. So Ray and I couldn't just go to the beach back in those days. And most of the people that did were unfortunately service staff. So it was people who were your cleaners or your maids, et cetera. And so we really wanted to tell the full global history of the area. And then this map really showed where those black communities were allowed to live. And notice how far away they are from the actual beach. Whereas nowadays, we think about how all of those locations are above sea level, and now all of those are at risk because people who live on the beach don't want to lose their property, so they're trying to come back into the city. So then we proposed these collages, which sort of tell the history of various diaspora communities. And then we built this exploded spice rack a lot of you guys draw exploded axonometric diagrams, but well, we actually built one and put it inside of the museum. I'm sure everybody in the staff really hated us when they had to do it because it was so many pieces. And so these are some of the collages we spoke about. So this is your lack of access to the beach. And the one on the left is sort of rituals that we do in the kitchen, like young girls getting their hair braided. And then each one of these spice jars references a different diasporic community's kitchen. 
And so you'll find certain little jokes on them as well. So like if you're African-American like myself, there was one that was filled with Lowry seasoned salt and it says, we put this shit on everything. And then there was another one that is hot sauce and it says, yes, hot sauce is a spice. And so what you find is that many different communities share little small little tidbits about themselves when it comes to the way that they cook, the ingredients they cook with. And it's just a very accessible way to get into the work without everybody needing to be an architect. Because I always feel like everybody understands space. Everybody just doesn't have an architecture degree. So I'm gonna shut up now and then pass it over to the kid with the braids. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm gonna start diving in with a project that we did for Lexus. That was actually Miami Design Week last year, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, yeah. So Lexus came to us with this proposal um, just about the things that they're about and kind of mixing the things that we're about in our lab, it's manipulation of space. And um, for this particular project, manipulation of transportation infrastructure and how that kind of bends the built environment in ways that we may not even be observant of. So in this picture, um, you can see the original, I guess, figure ground to be used an architectural term. And then um, one of the things that Jermaine is very big on is how do like, Different, different built things and infrastructure, how do they cause divisions and cause separation in a way that's um, manipulated on purpose? It might seem like an accident, but everything is by design. So you can kind of see everything went from this big open city area, this urban area, to now you have two to three different spaces um, within that just because of the interstate, which is something that we view as a commodity. And then again, um, there's a picture of this in the next slide, but just looking at this and observing and doing a study um, of what's called the race wall. So in different areas, maybe in some areas it might be based on socioeconomic factors such as income and things like that. And there's different smaller built factors that kind of separate people that are by design. And just as a, a note, this is a literal segregation wall that's in Liberty City. So if you are not from South Florida, if you go along 12th Avenue in between 62nd and 65th, there was a literal 14 foot tall wall to separate the black neighborhood from the white neighborhood. It wasn't until the 1970s that they knocked that wall down to where now it's only four feet high and it's a historic linear park. So these are real things in the built environment. So, um Taking all that into consideration, I think it kind of fits the theme of the final installation. Um, looking at quite literally the framework of transportation and how that all comes together. And then also, as I said before, keeping in mind what Lexus is about, this innovation and technology and um, just this bright futuristic aspect that kind of came um, into fruition with the final installation. And, um, so this was like what I remember the most popular part of the whole thing. Everybody loved the swing. Um, the swing was honestly just kind of a, like an additional interactive element that we decided to go with. And I don't remember this. And we also, we also <laughs> designed some furniture as well because they needed somewhere to sit. Uh, we actually gave a lot of the furniture away afterwards. Uh, Professor Indrid Alushani, I think you got a piece of furniture yourself, right? So this is all stuff that we, uh, the team designed and then we kind of just gave away towards the end. Uh, yes, so again, back to the theme of, I guess the overall theme of tonight, what does it mean to chill? Um, I think this project exemplifies that. Um, Thrive Delray is a, it's a nonprofit organization that we partner with um, up in Delray Beach. It's about an hour, an hour and a half north of where we are currently. And they, their goal, I guess, is to um, partner with different community organizations and um, bodies of churches and families around and just kind of do outreach and help them to um, connect with people like Chill Lab. Um, in, which this, in this case, we help them to do a series of remodelings, uh, installations and things to beautify their community and make um, their, their um, built environment more appealing and appeasing. And so here we are just run of the mill first week of studio, just analyzing the site, looking at the things that's around, um, just getting a feel for the area because one thing that Jermaine is very big on, if you've ever had him or had a conversation with him, is that you have to design for the people that live there and not just because I'm an architect and I wanna do what I wanna do. So one thing we do with every project is 
get a feel for the people that we're designing for. It doesn't matter if it's Lexus or Nike or Adidas. Or, you know, what, what's the history of this entity? Where, what is this area about? What are the people that live there and what are they about? So this is just all that understanding space, understanding the densities and things like that of this whole area of Delray. Um, and we do have a Nike project too. We just didn't show it because we don't have enough time for all that. <laughs> um, yeah, so we'll, we'll jump to one of the projects that we just finished was a tree planting uh, sort of community event. Because one of the things about a lot of black neighborhoods and a lot of underprivileged neighborhoods is not a lot of tree coverage. So instead of just planting regular trees like palm trees that do nothing, uh, we went and planted a lot of fruit trees so that it can also be a source of food for people in the community. And so this is us out with the community members in Delray Beach, where we're actually doing a lot of those activations. And again, this honestly really, we had the choice to go to this or not. I didn't go, not because I chose not to go, I was out of town, but if I had been here, I definitely would have went because that's something that Jermaine's very big on is, again, being active in the community. And this was an event that they invited us to participate in. And he basically was like, if y'all are here, like, you're going. You know, they didn't have a choice because it's a good opportunity to, to be out there and really be hands-on with the people of the neighborhood and of the community. And so things like this we do all the time, and we always try to expand it to the larger School of Architecture community. We have another one that's coming up in a few months where we're doing a ground painting of a design that we're doing of the local basketball court up in Delray. So if anybody wants to be a part of that, we always try to bring these things out to everyone, not just the people that's on the chill team. And so we do have a couple of things that are going to be built. Kayvon's going to talk about one more thing, and then we're going to jump to Noel, who will let you know the rest. So this is you can go St. Matthew's Parish Hall. This is St. Matthew's Parish. Um, so again, we just this is just a simple area diagram, um, a site study, just showing circulation, looking at the space that we have, what's existing, and trying to see what we can build upon or what we can change to benefit this this building. Um, so this is, I believe, yeah, so this one on the left is the current floor plan. And this was the one that we proposed to make the space more open and inviting. And uh, I think the next diagram shows it better. Yeah, so um, as it stands right now, there's a lot of structured elements, I guess, in this main space. So we wanted to come up with an idea that would make the community space more community friendly um, and open that space up and push a lot of the program and the necessities into the back of the building, um, which would allow this, this more open floor plan to have things such as sliding glass doors and open facade um, so that it brings the inside outside, oh, excuse me, the inside outside, but also allows for you know them to have different types of community events. And the last one was like a wedding or a birthday party and things like that. And we've already secured funding for this. Um, so this is actually, going through design review right now with the leadership of the church and construction will probably start in maybe like eight or nine months um, when it comes to this project. And then the next project, uh, Noel, will chat with you all about, and I'll get her started before she gets going. This is Ebenezer Wesleyan Church. Um, and for us, we're designing a Bahamian straw market uh, for them. And so this is the site of the market. Okay, hey y'all. So um, with this project, we are, like you said, designing the straw market that the um, members of the church and the community of the church will be able to share the space and um, have like this space to um, sell things that, they're, uh, that they make or have, and they'll be able to use the space like for events and um, anything that they may make, having that kept within the community is what the space will be used for. And here you see some renderings um, of the proposal that we had did. And the unique, each little cart is unique for whoever is gonna be selling their product and the pavilion design um, that our team came up with. Yeah. Um, just to add something, I think again, this project, like the I guess the motif that they came to us with was, if you're familiar with any form of Caribbean culture, they have things such as these open markets um, that they do every week or every so often and they participate in. And like Noel said, it brings the community together, allows them to sell, trade, buy goods that are locally grown and locally um, sourced. And they wanted to bring something like that to their community 
um, because they thought it would be a great idea for the people of the church and of the community to be able to come together once a week or however so often, um, be able to fellowship and, and um, just kind of participate in their own cultural things that they're used to doing back home. And I'll give you a little background on the, on the kiosk. So the site of the church is actually going to be a parking lot. And so we thought it would be clever if all of the kiosks were based off the module of a parking space. The parking space being uh, eight feet wide by 20 feet long. So all of the kiosks are eight feet uh, wide so they can fit directly in a parking stall so that while other cars are parked there, you still can also have the kiosk there as well. Um, and then when the cars are gone, things can be deployed and moved back and forth. And so that's where the actual proportions come from. And obviously all of you are architects, so you understand that nominal dimensions are typically four by eight. So that also makes it customizable, it makes it more affordable. Because when you're doing work in communities like this, you don't have the hugest budget in the world, so you want to be as clever as you can. And so each one of these different sort of typologies are all, again, based off that same module that can easily fit within a parking space. And so we tried to play around with the different roofscapes. Um, and then we'll actually go and get Bahamian straw weavers to do the actual patterns on the outside. Because again, we want to actually have those authentic elements within the project. So we'll provide the steel frame, and then they will come in and fill the gaps with all of the Bahamian straw. And so we've already reached out to a couple of people who do that within um, the neighborhood of Delray Beach, and everybody's super excited about it. We also have funding for this, and this is actually going through design review with the team in two weeks. So if we get a thumbs up with that, all of these will be starting to get built very quickly. So um, I know you guys are wondering why the hell hasn't George said anything. So George just joined the team four days ago, three days ago, four days ago. Um, and so because he's not aware of some of these projects going on, I have a question to pose to George. And then when George finishes answering this question, then we can open up to the discussion afterwards. So George, George has been following me around for two years now. George was first my student in ARC 112 to which George and I butted heads every other week because George didn't realize that I welcome banter. I welcome questioning. To me, how else do you learn by not questioning things? I think he thought I was gonna be annoyed by all the questions. I was like, yeah, keep on, keep them coming, keep them coming. And the very next semester, he had me again as a studio professor. And he's like, I'm actually excited about this. And then I put him through the ringer. And he was like, wow, Studio U is way worse than drawing class U. And then afterwards, he's like, actually, Jermaine, I went and worked in an office, and I missed the kind of conversations that we have and the kind of work that we do. Can I be your TA? Because again, he's been following me around for three years now. So he became my TA for a second year architecture studio. And he approached me and he said, hey, there's, there's work that you're doing in the lab. I'd love to be a part of it because I think that I'm more interested in work that helps people and centers people. To which I say, that's exactly what we do. If we have opportunities that will arise, absolutely join the team. And that's when I found out that we were gonna be in the Venice Biennale. So I asked George if he wanted to be on the team to work on that. And so my question to you, George, is what do you hope to get out of your time working with Chill? Well, I wanna start by saying I'm honored to be a part of the team. It's an extraordinary opportunity and I hope that I can get experience in actually working with people in communities, people who don't have the sort of access or even the general attention of most you know, people who work in our industry. Um, representation is incredibly important and <clears throat> a lot of the time we as you know, architects, we, we pay a great deal of attention to the the general idea of what a great space is or what a great urbanism looks like without really regarding what the people who already live there are because really there's no spaces in the world that aren't already occupied by people especially in the cities that we work in so our job I think is to reflect what's already there and have an enormous amount of respect for the kind of people and the kind of traditions that they have and the world that they want to live in because uh, uh, a lot of people don't have the kind of resources that um, we often are privileged enough to provide them with buildings, with built space. It, it's one of the most valuable 
resources that any sort of you know community can hope for. And so I'm hoping that by working in the Chill Lab, I can learn a lot more about the, the ways to interact with people and the, the things that they want and be able to integrate those sorts of things into my designs and the designs that I would be privileged enough to work on um, in the lab. Now you guys see why he's on the team. The kid's, the kid's pretty bright. So I'll, I'll pause it there. Uh, hi, May. Would you, would you like to jump in and ask anyone? I can give this mic up. We got like five microphones up here. So if anybody has any questions or anything, feel free to ask. Uh, that's what this is for. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. So thank you guys for um, the presentation. I really enjoyed the work that you guys showed. Um, has there been a specific project for you that has been quite pivotal for your studio? And if so, which one was it and why? Uh, most pivotal? Um, probably the MoMA project. So those, for those that don't know the unfortunate history of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, um, they had never had an all black architecture exhibition in the history of the museum. And it has the oldest architecture department out of all museums in the entire country. So over 100 years of history, it's never centered black practitioners until 2021. And fortunately, I was one of the 10 architects among thousands across the entire country that was chosen to be in this landmark show. I don't know why I was chosen, but I was. And I was the youngest in the exhibition. And our proposal, the spectrum of blackness, the collages, and the uh, exploded, ice, exploded spice rack ended up gaining so much international recognition that when you went to MoMA, our picture was right next to Basquiat's. Like it was insane to sort of see it. Every single news outlet, New York Times, Vogue magazine, all of them covered it and every single one used our project, even though there was nine other people in the show. So it really sort of became a coming out party uh, for our team. And then next thing we know, Lexus came calling, Nike came calling, um, Lexus came calling three times. So it kind of just took off uh, from there. So I think that was the, the one that changed everything. Do you consider yourself to be an architect or an artist? I consider myself to be a designer. And I say that because I think architectural education teaches you how to design things from multiple scales. Um, I don't look at it as a tool for problem solving. I look at it as a way to synthesize things. Uh, I am not a problem solver. I am not a hero. I am not a savior. Neither are these four amazing humans up here in the front. But they all have design talents that allow them to synthesize the needs of someone. So I call myself a designer because we design chairs. We design installations, we design buildings, we design parks. I think calling ourselves architects is too limiting in what we do, and I think calling ourselves artists is too free of what we do because there are still some constraints in what we do. And, and is it possible to achieve racial equity, not as an activist, but as a designer? As a designer? As a designer. You said that you're a designer, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I personally, cannot achieve racial equity because in this country, I am the oppressed party. Um, there's varying levels of oppression. Um, I am a man, so there are certain things that I am privileged that someone that is not a man, unfortunately, is not. Um, but when it comes to these sort of issues, what we can do in the lab is bring attention to important issues so that people can understand and see a different perspective. And so oftentimes, it might be the Venezuelan uh, weaver who doesn't have a job, but then we want to put forth the project because, again, you guys should really get close to those chairs. The weaving is immaculate. It is so beautiful. Like, that's the kind of stuff that we want to show. We want to use design to tell those stories. So for us, we call ourselves designers because we feel we can use objects, installations, drawings to tell narratives of people who oftentimes have them ignored or completely removed. Yeah, any, any more questions? From Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, I see the core values that the Chill Lab has and brings to UM and to Miami and Florida, South Florida in general, but is there an end goal 
uh, or just a goal and objective that you're trying to achieve? Yeah, this is this is being recorded. Okay, I'll be honest anyway. Um, I'll, I'll I'll tell you the fundamental the fundamental thing behind chill. Just be I'm gonna be totally honest with you. Schools of architecture are extremely expensive. The average student does not have the financial privilege to be able to achieve the things they want to achieve in this field because most people have to do unpaid internships. That's something I had to do. But I'm fortunate enough to have parents that can pay for me to do these types of things. My first internship was in Cape Town, South Africa. It was completely unpaid. It was for four months. My parents paid my rent, put money in my pocket every single day. That's not normal for most young people, right? So for me, the main motivation of chill is to give architecture students an opportunity to just focus on architecture. There's many times that they don't do anything and they still get paid. Because in my opinion, them getting their degrees, yeah, you laughing because you know it's true. There's, like, the, the thing is, how can I make sure you graduate from this place and still have all of your mental faculties? Because not everybody has access to money. And so I wish I can take in all of the students who don't have that access and make the lab full of people, but I also want to pay a fair wage. So we typically cap the lab at around four people because that's the most I can afford to pay out of all the research grants. So if you ask me what's my impact, whenever they force us to do the yearly annual review of how much stuff we completed in our lab, I just focus on how many students got good grades and how many graduated in our graduate school. So we have one student that just graduated from Yale. She's now a professor at Cornell. We have another student that works at David Ajay's office in New York. She's one of their lead designers. We have another student that's the Harvard GSD right now. We have two more students that are at Columbia and another that's at University of Michigan in law school because she wants to litigate on behalf of architects in the built environment. So to me, that's the way that we're successful. This other stuff is cool because it allows me to keep paying them money and that's why I have to keep taking on these projects. Trust me, I don't want to do them. And I don't want to do them because the school demands a lot of me, like teaching you all. But if it's a way so that Kayvon can not show up to work for two days and still be able to get paid, that's fine. If it's way for Noel to not have to show up, that's awesome. Clarissa wasn't that bad. Clarissa would disappear every now and then, but even she would disappear at times, right? So to me, that's the real purpose of Chill. And what we're trying to do here is trying to, at least to make it a little bit more equitable. Like, I'll get off my soapbox now, but that's honestly, that's the honest true goal. Can I tell a story? Sure. Okay, so Professor Indra, this goes back to your question, but the turning point for me um, working in the lab was when we did Nike. Um, I don't think Jermaine remembers this, but I had him my freshman year for I think 112. And um, I, I, he, you were the first person that made me realize or understand that architectural design is a specified skill. It's something that you're trained and taught, but that doesn't limit the bounds of what you can do. And I remember he told me, yeah, I have friends that work on the design team for Nike and this, this, and that. And it opened my mind to the limits of what I could be and what I can do, not only with this degree, but with this training and this teaching. And then um, here it is two, three years later, we get this um, proposal, this RFP to do an installation for Nike. And I think I missed a meeting or I came late or something. And he was like, let me holler at you. And he let me know it's different. He said, it's cool when you can slack off in, in class and you can, you can make it up at the end of the semester and be okay. We said, this is real and there's money on the line. There's real people's lives being impacted here. So I need you to understand, like, this is serious. And it just kind of puts everything into perspective of an opportunity of being able to be in this room and, and meet with these people. And for me, it was something that I said I wanted to do but he's like, if you really want to do it, like, it's not going to come easy. And so having that, that mentorship, that, that somebody that's willing to pull you to the side and like, hey, this is what you said. Like, I'm trying to help you get there, but shake, shake it together. You know, that's, um, that's something that for me personally, I'll never forget. But it also speaks to his character and what he was just talking about is his heart is very big and he wants to look out for everybody. I think I fired Kayvon like four times. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure I fired Kayvon like four times. Every time I'm like, Kayvon, this is the last time you can come late to work. You come late again, you're out of the lab. Do you know how many people want your spot? And then he'll come and he'll do amazing work for like three weeks. I'm like, all right, I'll chill. Then he comes late again. I was like, do you know how many people want your spot? So that's, but he's about to graduate. So that spot's going to be open soon. 
<laughs> Just saying. You're recruiting, recruiting people here. Anybody else? Right behind you. Hello, I have a question um, regarding um, your influence in the curriculum and how you can actually embed some of Chill's ideals, goals, and aspirations into the curriculum that we have in the School of Architecture. Because I know you have led um, studios, now you're leading a um, upper class level studio right now. You also have led some of the drawing classes as well. So I'm just curious as to how you also plan to infiltrate those ideals and ideologies into some of our other classes. So, um Two years ago, I was uh, made coordinator of ARC 203. No, 20, yeah, 203? It's 204 now. But okay, 204 soon, um, which is architecture in the environment. And historically, that was a course that was purely around uh, sort of flora, fauna, landscapes, urbanism, and what we design. So I tried to expand that to also include social and political issues. So for the past couple of years, students have begun to see what it means to map in communities of color but then also do proposals in community and color that are rooted in real, like real life. And so no crazy budgets, no crazy structures that might not even be possible in a neighborhood like Overtown. There's some sort of realness that's rooted in it. And so everybody has to take that course. And that's like the one example I can think of that I've been able to put that in there. Um, I used to teach a seminar called Criminal Architecture where we did a survey from uh, Wall Street with uh, the market crash all the way into Hurricane Katrina where the students made music videos. And the music videos talked about space from their own perspective. Uh, Kayvon was actually in that class as well. Uh, oh yeah, and back there as well, what's up? <laughs> right? Um, so in, in that class, like that's another way people to understand the ways that the built environment engenders inequity. Um, and then in my upper level studios, and this one specifically, uh, it's called What We Once Were. And students have been understanding in their own home countries and hometown what type of infrastructure, what type of political issues have begun to shape their own environment. And Jaime, you might appreciate this. One of my students is from Venezuela. And when we first did the first introductory class, the students said, well, we don't have these same issues there that you guys have here in the States. <laughs> and then they went back and researched and was like, I didn't know that we had a lot of the exact same issues. And I'm like, that there's certain structural things. It might not materialize as racial because it might be a more, more equity in that. But you'll find the hierarchical of economies as well, and you see very quickly how that highway that splits the neighborhood was on purpose. Yeah. That, that train station that doesn't go into a certain neighborhood, that was on purpose. And so one of the most fulfilling things was that student, a student from Colombia, and a student from Brazil realizing that America is not special. There's other, there's other areas that also have these same issues, they just hadn't had a chance to have access to them. And so these are the ways I try to bring chill into the curriculum. Oh, and everybody, that's Sasha Brax. Sasha is also on the Venice Biennale team. Yes. Hey. So your work is filled with iconography, and I mean that the 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 issue of meaning is embedded in every single project. I read in a recent interview that you said that the happiest day of your life is the day that you get a haircut, and then. <laughs> And then, uh, it rem when I read that, it reminded me when I used to live in West Philadelphia. And my neighbor in the porch had one chair like that in who that was you. I mean, he was a barber. So he had a barber shop in downtown Philadelphia, but he would also use a chair just like that for his barber shop in the porch in West Philly. When I see that sort of calm in the back, uh, I mean, it reminded me immediately of that. Can you elaborate a little bit on the way that you go from the real world to the abstract world of art and objects of, um, for installations? Yeah. Sure, I'm, I'm so glad that you caught on that. And the reason why haircut days are my favorite days, because haircut day, I feel like a superhero. Like, you can't tell me anything. If I got a fresh haircut, like I'm walking outside, I am the boss of the world. And I know everybody feels this way, maybe as we get your nails done or something like that, but everybody has that feeling. Mine is when I get a haircut. So that's why that's important to me. And it was great how you weave those narratives together because there really is the porch research and there really is like our iconography and these, these objects. And so for us, I like to say it's if you know, you know. And clearly, Jaime, you know. So I don't have to explain it to you, right? And so for me, it's being able to bring in these objects that have a clear reference 
in a history that people can resonate with and they don't have to be architects, but then we can bring it out into the public sphere and then people can also engage with it from a design perspective. So when Clarissa started designing the, the, the chairs for this exhibition, I gave her five or six pictures. Some was the hair comb, some was the, the junk new bands and stuff you saw. And I was like, hey, these are the important artifacts. Now synthesize that into this object that we can then use. And I remember telling her, the chair, the, piece, the part that people sit on, has to be weaving because it has to reference hair braiding. And she was like, what are you talking about? I'm like, just trust me. It has to be weaving. And then she's the one that found the amazing weaver to get that specific pattern. But it always starts in us knowing things and then trying to translate that in a way that people who also know get it. Uh -huh. And I'm so happy that you get it. And that those who don't understand can still see it and appreciate it as, in our opinion, a beautiful object. But I don't have to explain it because I don't want to have to, you don't want to explain everything, right? You want it to stand for itself. And if you do have to explain it, it's probably not the right audience. Because it's like, if I have to explain this to you, I don't want you to steal it, or I don't want you to commodify it, or I don't want you to make it into something that we don't want to keep for ourselves. You can just see it as a chair that you can sit in. But Jaime and I will know this is the barber chair. Yeah. And like, and, right, exactly. So that's, that's kind of the way that it works. Yeah. Um, anyways, they're telling me that we have to wrap up. Boo. <laughs> so um, for our students, I think that tonight you've been able to realize that um, there's a whole deal of autobiography in everything that we do. And that contemporary architecture, and I mean that this is part of contemporary architecture, that this is not isolated from the, the zeitgeist, from the moment. And in my opinion, I mean, when he speaks about synthesis, it, all, it reminds me of Hegel, uh, when he says that you always have to have dialectics. You always have to have one position that is positive, one position that is negative, and then synthesize the two positions in the most meaningful manner. And I believe that that's what the CHILL lab is all about. And it's important not just to read and look at issues of architecture, but uh, of um, uh, journals of architecture, but also about issues of philosophy and theory, because that's how, I mean, you're gonna be able to develop your mind. I mean, this love for uh, wisdom is fundamental uh, in the life of an architect. Uh, we want to um, thank the members of the CHILL Lab and Jermaine Barnes for joining us tonight, and please uh, give them a round of applause. Thank you, and please ask them many questions yeah. of stuff that they probably didn't want to say in front of a microphone to get real answers out of them, so yeah. please ask them whatever you want. Please remember that this, we're going to do these salons every other Thursday. The next one will be uh, Thursday of next week. Lou Lab uh, with uh, Professor Christopher Meyer and Shauna Meyer will be the next um, salon. Uh, the uh, coordinator or the person that will be introducing the lab will be the director of the graduate program, Joe Lamir. Uh, so thank you very much, much for joining us, and please socialize and stay as much as you can. Okay, thank you.